Praise the Lord. Before we hear the preach of God's word today, let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank thee, Lord, for this day which thou hast made. That we rejoice and be glad in it. And as thou art our shepherd, we shall not wait. We thank the Lord for giving us this day our daily bread. As man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of thy mouth. As thy word, O Lord, is truth, we pray those even sanctify us with thy truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Once again, let us return to the Bible's book of James chapter 5 once again. In the book of James chapter 5. Beginning in verse 14, once again, that is written, Is any sick among you? Once again, we live in a world that is cursed. The world lieth under wickedness, the Bible says. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. Christ says that though we're in this world, we're no longer part of this world. So why are we in this world for? To be lights shining in this world. To be witnesses unto Christ. For the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. The promise of his coming. As some men count slackness. But is long suffering to us word. Not only that any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. We see the signs of the times. We know the day of the Lord draweth nigh. Christ is coming again. The same way that he went away. And like manner she also come again. In a day in the earth that no man knoweth. Save the Father which is in heaven. But each and every day the Lord tarries. Is because of his long suffering. Why does the Lord tarry? Why is the Lord not slack in his promise? Does some man call slackness? Why is it seen the Lord is tearing for? Because the Lord is not willing for any to perish, but that all should come to repentance. And all around us, souls are perishing. Therefore, in this world, this world that's full of pestilences, this world that's full of trials and tribulations, wars and rumors of wars, and perplexity of nations, the Lord has us in this world to be witnesses unto Christ. The Lord has us in this world for souls to be saved. And it is each and every day as the Lord tarries, we're to be in the will of God, to obey Christ's great commission, to go into the world and to preach the gospel to every creature, for neither is there salvation than any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But while we're in this world for a reason for our souls to be saved, we're promised by the Lord Jesus Christ we shall experience what? In this world ye shall have tribulation. And one of the tribulations we're going to have in this world is we're going to get sick. Even in the book of Philippians chapter 2, we read of a man named Epaphroditus who was sick nigh unto death. And why was he sick? For the work of the ministry. In this world in which we serve the Lord, in which we give it 100% holy to the Lord, we're going to push our bodies like Epaphroditus and be sick and even sick nigh unto death. And how was it Epaphroditus was healed? Because the apostle prayed for him and gave thanks to the Lord for what? For the Lord's mercy. Not just only upon Epaphroditus, but upon the apostle himself. It was not the faith of the apostle. It was not some kind of special power the apostle had. It was all because of the mercies of the Lord. Once again... In order to get answered to prayer, we must have faith. And where must we have faith? Mark 11:22. have faith in God. And who is God? 
First John chapter 4, verse 8, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. To have faith in God, you must have faith in God's love. And what does God answer our prayers for? Because we're somebody special? Because we've got some special title? No. God answers our prayer because he is love and his mercy endureth forever. Psalm 136, verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Therefore, if there's any sick among us, as the Bible says, is any sick among you, James 5, verse 14, let him call for the elder of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now in this country we're currently living in, in which most of the population are laborers, therefore they're considered poor. Now they have food and many of them have housing. They're not at deep poverty, but there's only a few percentage that is extremely rich here. And the rest of the people are poor, they call poor. There is no really middle class in Thailand. It's a very small middle class. It's either few that are very rich, and the majority of people here in Thailand are what they call poor. Now, they're not destitute. Many people have houses and lands here, and they have plenty of food. Praise God for that. But people are poor in that they're laborers, and they get to work with their bodies. And as we minister to laborers, there's one thing that happens is they push their bodies too hard when it comes to laboring. Many years ago, was I was invited to preach the Thai Burmese border in Kachanaburi in a place called Simungkhon, which was such a faraway place that when I took the bus from Bangkok to Kachanaburi and then was looking for the bus to Simungkhon and I saw the sign in Thai, I asked the driver just to confirm, is this bus going to semen coin? And he asked me, are you sure? Nah, China, are you sure? That's how far away and destitute this place was in semen coin. And in this area, semen coin of the Thai Burmese border, most of you are working in the sugarcane fields. And they're doing slash and burn farming in those very unhealthy place to go to. We went there for the gospel's sake. And though he said in Simon Coin, on the Lord's sake, at the preaching place called Hui Nam Kao, which was a little bit farther away, but still on the Thai Burmese border, nonetheless, praise God. And as I was staying there with a, a Karin man who lived in America now, was once a refugee here in Thailand, and we knew each other 20 years ago, as we're watching the laborers slashing the sugar canes, which they're going to burn. He was telling about when he first went to America, all the refugees had to go to school. And they all were excited thinking they're going to go to a school to learn English. No, that's not the school they went to for. They went to a school to teach them how to pick things up, how to lift things. Because you see, in this part of the world, they don't know how to lift. They don't know really how to labor. And they'll do everything wrong and hurt their backs and strain their bodies. And these Korean refugees that went to America, they had to go to a school to learn how to do manual labor so that after they finish that school, then they can work manual labor jobs in America and do it correctly, which they do not do here. So we minister amongst the laborers. What we have learned is many of them, even professing Christians, are alcoholics. Now, here in Thailand, there's different kinds of alcohol. There's some alcohol called whiskey. There's some alcohol called moonshine. And there's some alcohol they actually call a medicine. Ya Dong. They actually call it a medicine. And all around Thailand, and all the little mom and pop shops, and even little street vendors have this thing called Ya Dong. Is that how I say it? Am I saying it correctly? And it's, uh, it's almost homemade. It's not up to... Uh, a code is not up to the FDA approval and it's really strong and they consider it medicine and it's such strong alcohol what it does is it numbs 
the laborers' bodies because they're in such pain after so many years of pushing their bodies and working so hard, they're in so much bodily pain, they have pulled muscles, they have strained vertebrae, their back is out of line, their legs are messed, everything's messed up in their bodies, they can't sleep at night, so they drink this very strong alcoholic drink, which they actually call a medicine, and they drink that it's so strong, it numbs their bodies, and then they're able to sleep. Many laborers will tell me that if they don't drink that, not only can they not sleep, they'll have fevers because their bodies are so out of whack and so messed up, they'll have fevers. And they have to drink this every night just to be able to sleep and just to be able to survive. And then we praise God that back in 1993, I learned the art of myotherapy or sugar point therapy. And for many years, I tried not to do it. But then, praise God, I've learned this is how we get the laborers off of the alcohol and the drugs they're on by taking care of their physical bodies. And in James chapter 5, verse 14, which it is written, Is any sick among you? Let me call for the others church and let them pray over him. I anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. What we have learned in going back through church history and reading the early church writings, when the anointed people with oil, this was actually a way to physically heal people. They used olive oil back then as a medicine to apply to the places where people were sick. Just like today, we may use bombs and things such as that to help the physical process. What this shows us is we must use the supernatural and the natural together. Because a lot of times you're praying for somebody, and as God is a God of sowing and reaping, and they've been sowing to the flesh so long, especially with the labors, and they destroyed their bodies so bad in their laboring work, God doesn't do magic. He doesn't just heal their bodies like that. They've got to take care of their bodies. And then many laborers, like I've testified about before, will drink this strong alcoholic beverage, and then you pray for them to be healed in their physical bodies, but their livers are destroyed. Their stomach area, and stomach is more just stomach, it's the intestines, the pancreas, the bladder, the liver, because the alcohol they're drinking, it has destroyed their different organs in the abdomen area. And they have all kinds of serious problems because of that, and God doesn't do magic. They've got to get off those kind of things. Many years ago, a man came to me. I guess he knew me through other Christians. He wanted me to take him to the doctors. He met me downstairs at this building early in the morning. Went in downstairs to meet him. He was trying to buy something from the motorbike taxi driver. Most likely illegal drugs. When he saw me come downstairs, he turned around and walked into the wall and put his nose into the wall. And the motorbike tax driver who knew me at preaching the gospel and saw that I was with this guy, he began mocking him, saying, you don't want it? You don't want it? You don't? Are you sure you don't want it? And the man, the professing Christian, kept his nose in the wall trying to hide in this wall. He was trying to buy drugs. Many of the laborers know they're addicted to alcohol. They're addicted to amphetamines or methamphetamines, whatever the difference is here. Before they used to buy these drugs at the pharmacies, now they have to buy them through motorbike taxi drivers and people that would deal those drugs as it's now illegal. It's so illegal that people lose their minds and lose their souls, of course. And this professing Christian, I guess, he needed some energy and was gonna try to buy some of these amphetamine pills to give him some energy, but I came down too soon and almost caught him in the deal. Well, the motorbike driver is laughing and drove off. Then I take this man to the hospital. And because he was very slow and he thought he was actually moving fast, and I guess because of his addiction to drugs, he didn't get any of that day, is moving extra slow. What he did the hospital was he pulled out of his bag what's called Yadong and took a swig of that, put it back in his bag, got some water, cleaned his mouth out, and he thought 
Nobody can see him. That's the problem with drug addicts. That's the problem with those people that are on drugs. What they remind me of is somebody trying to break in your house in the daytime. Could you imagine in the broad daylight, somebody dressed in black sneaking in your window and crawling on your floor? You just, what is this guy doing? What does this guy think he's doing? That's drug addicts. They think you don't know, but it's so obvious. They're so obvious with it. Everybody sees it. Everybody knows. And this poor guy, not only did I see it, the whole hospital saw it. They saw me with the Bible taking care of him, and they almost felt sorry for me having to take care of this guy. And of course, when he sees the doctor, and the doctor was telling him, you got to take care of your body. You got to stop drinking alcohol. You got to start taking care of your body. He didn't want to hear that. He wanted some magic done to him. And then brought him back here to our room and sat him down, asked him what his problem was. And eventually he confessed. He, for many decades of his life, he used to have to carry rice, sacks full of rice. That used to be his job. He used to do it incorrectly. And as we talked about using the body correctly, it all made sense to him because he used to wonder why they can never pick a vehicle up front ways, but if you're on backwards, they can lift the vehicle up easily because they're keeping their back straight using their legs. He just learned that. Decades, he'd been carrying rice sacks wrong. It destroyed his back. I began working on his back through trigger point therapy or myotherapy. His back was completely out. He was in so much pain, and we had to tell him, you've got to take care of your body. There's things that you have to do and take care of your body. He didn't want to hear that. Never heard from him again. Once again, God is a God of sowing and reaping. God does not do magic. In the Bible, the Bible is against superstitions. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 22. Then Paul, to the midst of Marcion, said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that all things ye are too superstitious. Many professing Christians are superstitious. Many professing Christians look to sicknesses in a very superstitious way. And they want God to do magic, not realizing the God of the Bible, whom we have faith in, is a God of what? A God of sowing and reaping. Therefore, they pray for the sick. Many of times you've got to take care of, or they have to take care of, how they have sown wrong to their bodies. We're all going to send in the judgment. How you've treated your body, you'll be judged for in the judgment. The Bible calls our bodies the temple of the Holy Ghost. If you don't take care of your body, the Bible says you're defiling the temple of the Holy Ghost, and you will be judged for that. Therefore, Christians are careful what we eat. We're careful what we drink. We're careful how we take care of our bodies. We are responsible for our own bodies and taking care of it. And when it comes to sicknesses and praying for the sick, you got to take care of these things as well. God does not do magic. In James chapter 5, verse 14, the anointing with oil is not magic. There is nothing magical about the oil. In James chapter 5, verse 14, is any sick among them coffee out of the church and let them pray for him, anoint the oil in the name of the Lord. The focus is not on the oil. There's no magic in the oil. The oil does not heal people by itself. This is using the supernatural prayer and the natural together. Because when it comes to sicknesses, there's things you have to do. Too many people with their faith in doctors today. And they have a superstitious faith in doctors and believe in that medicine is the cure-all. Now, a lot of medicines out there do not cure you. 
In fact, most medicines, they just make you think you're feeling better, such as the majority of painkillers. Yes, you may have a fever, and you take a painkiller, and right away when it goes to work, your fever breaks and brings the fever down, you're not cured. You're not healed. You still have the affection in your body. The painkillers just numbs your body to where your body stops doing the fever, and it's slowing the healing process down. By doing so, it's not healing you. It's not curing you. I remember back when my eldest daughter was sick, and of course, I am the worst patient in the world. And we took her to the doctors. And I was asking the doctor, what can we do for her to get healed? And I was about to beat this poor doctor up. And eventually, he, he understood me, praise God. It's not our family doctor. It's a different doctor. We're in a different place at the time in Hoi Kwong in Bangkok. And he sat me and I said, hey, listen. He said, we doctors, we have no faith in medicine. If you would just rest and drink plenty of water, that cures everything. Medicine is just, what is that, Choi Ban Tao. Takes care of the situation. It takes care of the temporal situation. He says, rest and drink plenty of water. That does it all for you. Praise God. But not just rest and drink plenty of water. There's physical things you got to do as well. What happened to me on the start of the time? What it was, we're saying that a house, and it was owned by a Vietnamese Thai man who was a bachelor. He was single. And I guess he had never cleaned his house in however many decades he lived in it. And it was very dusty. And we learned then that my eldest daughter, she has allergies when there's a lot of dust. And immediately when he got out of that house, she was immediately healed right away. You see, again, the natural and the supernatural. When it comes to sicknesses, you've got to make a lifestyle change. Whatever sickness you go through, yes, we pray, and yes, God answers prayer, but there's something natural you've got to do as well. Lifestyle change is the number one way for the body to fix itself. You get to find out what the cause is, just like Melissa started was sick at the time when she was very young, the cause was all that dust, and you got to change. Get out of that dirty house and go somewhere else. And then your body can get better. Again, in James 5, verse 14, Is any sick among them called the other church? Let them pray over him and order the oil. In the name of the Lord, verse 15, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Once again, the prayer of faith is faith in God. Mark eleven twenty two. Jesus answered and said to him, have faith in God. And who is God? First John 4, verse 8. God is love. We never pray to God with a title or an office. The elder here is not a title or an office. And it's not because somebody has a special title or office. That's why God answers their prayers that's wrong. The elders are people that have been in the Lord longer than you. And elders are plural form. Those that have been in the Lord longer than you, older than you, come and pray for you. And it's not their prayers, but the prayer of faith, their faith in God that saves the sick or heals the sick. Once again, in Philippians chapter 2, it is written... Philippians chapter 2. <coughs> Verse 25, Yet I suppose it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, and companion labor, and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to me once. For he longed after you all, was full of heaviness, because he had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh to death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I have sorrow upon sorrow. I said him therefore the more carefully, that when you see him again, he may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation, because for the work of Christ he was nigh to death, 
not regarded as a life that's applied your lack of service toward me. Why was he sick? Because of the work of Christ. And he was so sick, he was sick nigh to death. The apostle did not have special powers to heal him. The apostle did not come to the Lord in the title or office of apostle, and now God has to answer his prayers because he's an apostle. That's not how he got healed. The apostle did not have some kind of special healing anointing or any kind of magical power to heal him. No, it was the apostle's faith in God who had mercy. God answers our prayer because he has mercy on us. Why does God have mercy on us? Because God is love. And if your faith is in God who is love, believing that God's going to answer your prayers because of his mercy towards us, because of his love towards us, that's faith in God. That's the prayer of faith that shall save the sick, that heals the sick, that receives answer to prayer. As Jesus Christ says in Mark eleven twenty two, 22, have faith in God. We don't come to God because we're sons of God, because we've been born again, and because our Father gets to answer us. No. We don't come to God because we've been gifted and called to do some ministry. No. We come to God out of faith in him who is love. Believing he will be merciful to us and answer our prayers because of his mercy. The apostle, not say God answers prayer because Paul was an apostle or pray special apostolic prayers or had some kind of special apostolic power. God answered the apostle's prayer for Phoditis because God had mercy on him. Praise the Lord. Again, I've given this testimony many of times. Back in 2005, my late mother came to visit my family and I here in Thailand. And the idea was I was supposed to meet her at the airport, her and one of her friends and her friend's husband, and they were in Vietnam at the time, and then they're going to travel here to meet my family. We had not seen each other for many years, over a decade. The last time I saw my mother before 2005 was in 1990. So for 15 years, we had seen one another. And she had thought I died in the tsunami in 2004. And because I can to write letters to her and send her Bibles and tracts and write letters to her, I always wrote my phone number down. And because she thought I died in the tsunami, she saw on the television how the tsunami hit the south of Thailand, and she thought everybody died and thought I had died as well. She called the number, and I happened to be on the Thai Burmese border of the mountains and didn't have a signal, and she thought, well, sure, I must be dead, and would leave me these voice messages of crying and things such as that. And then I got to the place where I had a signal, and I'm still alive, praise the Lord. And she was so excited, she came to visit us. However, the night before she was to arrive here in Thailand, I only had about five baht, or a little bit over five baht. I used some of the money for a bus to go preach the gospel on the royal field, Sanam Luang, and then I had five baht left over for the bus back. But while I was at the royal field and had this fine baht, a man came up to me and asked me for five baht. Not six baht, not ten baht, not two baht, five baht, which is all that I had. So I gave that money to that man. So not only that night, would I have to walk back to where we're living right now at Sanam Luang, but also there was no way I'd be able to pick up, meet my mother at the airport and bring her back here. But I have faith in God. Not because I'm a preacher. I didn't come to God and say, God, I'm preaching the gospel, you got to supply my need. I didn't come to God and say, God, I'm an evangelist and you've got to take care of my needs. No. I ask God to have mercy on me. And my faith was in God's love and in God's mercy. The preaching of the gospel is not why God answers my prayers. God answers my prayers because my faith is in him, in his mercy, and in his love. And praise God as we're preaching the gospel at the Sanam Luang, or what's known as the Royal Field, 
and are preaching to times. There happened to be this American man who was a real big giant. His head was bigger than my shoulders. He was a very tall man, married to a small Taiwanese lady, and they took in their daughter out for a walk. And they happened to see us preaching the gospel. They're preaching the Thai tongue. And while he saw us preaching the gospel, the Lord led him to give me a blessing, which not only brought, us, brought me back here that night, but was enough money for me to get to the airport the next day to meet my mother as well. And again, it was not because I was preaching the gospel. It was not because I'm evangelist God answered my prayers. It's because my faith was in God who is love. James chapter 5. Once again, what kind of prayer saves or heals the sick? In James chapter 5, verse 15, that is written. <coughs> and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Where is our faith? Our faith is in God. Who is God? God is love. It's because of God's love and God's mercy is why God answers our prayer. This is why so many do not receive healing in the church today. Because of false teachings. Some believe you got to have faith in faith. Meaning you got to have enough faith. Do you have enough faith to be healed? you got to have faith in faith. Some believe you got to have faith in special people or special anointings or special callings or special powers or call the right people or say the right words. But in actuality, you got to have faith in God. And too many professing Christians today do not know God. They know about God. They know of God. But they do not know God. And if you don't know God, you can't have faith in God. To be pressing Christians, they do not have faith. They have superstitions. And they're using superstitions for healing. As if God has some kind of magical power in oils. Or God has some kind of magical power in the right prayers. Or the right people. Or the right things. And they have superstitions and not faith. Our faith must be in God, and God is love, and it's because of his mercy, he answers our prayer. And this is what is written, verse 15. And the Lord shall raise them up, and we have committed sins, they shall be forgiven to him. Because we're praying to God who is love. We're praying according to God's mercies. It's not about sin. It's not about, oh, he's been a bad boy, or, or this and that. It's because of God's mercy. Now, there is a group. They're here in Thailand. They're known as Word of Faith. They use a Greek word to call themselves by Rhema. And this group believes falsely that they'll live to be 120 years old. Even the founder of the group died in his 80s or 90s, but they still believe they're going to live to be 120 years old. You see, when, when the Lord spoke to Noah, God gave the world at the time 120 years. Noah had 120 years to build the ark. But they've taken that scripture out of context, believing God has given man 120 years to live. And this group believes they're going to live 120 years. There was a man from Nagaland, who is a pastor of a church here in Thailand now, that believes in that heresy known as Word of Faith or Ramah. And we had an argument together as he believed he would live to be 120 years. And I explained to him, what about the apostles? And they all got martyred. What about the apostle James in the Bible? What about Stephen? And this man had the gall to say that it was because they were in sin and didn't have enough faith. Can you believe that? Can you believe there's people like that that think they know more than the apostles or have more faith than the apostles? And after that, needless to say, we had no more fellowship together and didn't really talk to each other after that again because he is a heretic and that is a heresy. And because they believe they're going to live to be 120 years old, if somebody is sick or is not living 120 years old, they blame it on their professions, they blame it on their faith, or they blame it on sin. When you have faith in God, and you pray the prayer of faith, 
Not only is the prayer of faith, faith in God, save the sick, heal the sick. Not only is the Lord raised them up. If you have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Again, God forgives sins. Psalm 103, once again. The 103rd Psalm. Verse 1, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. God is love. Not only does he forgive us of all of our iniquities, and please say the word all, he healeth us of all all our diseases. Now as he heal us of all of our diseases, he forgiveth us of all of our iniquities. James chapter 5, once again. When we pray the prayer of faith, faith in God, God who is love, God whose mercy endureth forever, and God shows mercy to us in answering our prayers because of his love and mercy, not only does he heal the sick and raise the sick up, if the sick, verse 15, committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. For God not only healeth us of all of our diseases, he forgiveth us of all of our iniquities. This is why we must have faith in God. Again, the church the Lord led us to back in 1996, I'll look away. They were trained up in, which is not the same today, the Dora Faith Church and Bible School. Back then, they had a big sign up that said what? God is love. So they used to, not today, have two big doors open up, and they had a partition. And then the sanctuary is behind the partition. And in this partition here, a big sign that when you open the door, everybody can see it, even from the streets. God is love. You see, when you believe that God is love, when you know this God who is love, and you have faith in God who is love, that's how you receive answers to prayers. And back then, that church was known for raising the dead. That church was known for signs, wonders, and miracles. Not because they had any special powers. Not because any kind of special anointings. It's because they had faith in God. And God is love. And because God is love, not only does the Lord raise up the sick, He also forgives us of all of our iniquities. He forgives us of all of our sins. If he commits sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, pray one for another, that she may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of who? Of a righteous man availeth much. Now, in Isaiah chapter 64, it is written. Isaiah chapter 64. Verse 6. We are all as an unclean thing, and all our, now make sure to focus on the word our, O-U-R, all our righteousness are as what? Filthy rags. We all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Our righteousness cannot save us. Our righteousness said of God is filthy rags. Now, we're not going to get into what those filthy rags are, but if you want to get into Hebrew, it is the filthy of the filthiest rags. It's the kind of rags that make you want to throw up. The kind of rags that my wife and daughters had better get out of the house 
and don't leave laying around and you throw it away, make sure to tie up that bag and get rid of it. That's the kind of rags that verse is speaking of. That's what our righteousness is in the sight of God. Our righteousness cannot save us. Before I was born again, I thought I was a good person because I knew people worse than me. And before I was born again, I thought and people exalted me for having a girlfriend for three years. We lived together. We were not married and people exalted me for that. What a good guy. That guy is, he's a good man. Back before born again, we go to see fortune tellers as we used to be heathens. And the fortune tellers would tell my wife, you've got a good man. Stay with that man. He's a really good man. And you see, because I came from divorce and remarriage, as my earthly father had been divorced many of times, my mother had been divorced many of times, I thought if I never got married, I could outdo them and just stay faithful to my girlfriend without being married, thinking I was better than this godly institution of marriage that God created. I thought I was better than everybody else, and people exalted me what a good person I was. I used to drink alcohol, but not all the time. People thought, wow, he's good, because I had what's called structured discipline. I wouldn't drink all the time. When I had boxing matches, I'd stay sober. I wouldn't touch that stuff. And after my fights were through, I'd take a few days off and get drunk. And then after that, stop, get back in the gym, work out again. You know, what a good guy. I used to smoke marijuana, but not all the time. I had, again, what's called structured discipline. And people, wow, he's good. He didn't get stoned all the time, only every once in a while. Only when I had the time to do that and focus on my duty of being a boxer and being disciplined. And people gave me the thumbs up and thought I was a good guy. What is that in the Son of God? Filthy rags. What happened to me? Second Corinthians chapter 5. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 21. For he that is God hath made him, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When I got born again, I was made. Made what? The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. As is written, Ephesians chapter 2. In the book of Ephesians chapter 2. Once again in verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God that of works as a man should boast. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship created or made in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God before ordained that we should walk in them. In Christ we are made into the righteousness of God. In Christ, <coughs> we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. What happens when we're born again? We enter into the New Testament, the New Covenant, which is Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them in their hearts, and I'll be them a God that shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach their men his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For all be merciful their unrighteousness, and their sins and iniquities are member no more. What happens in the New Testament? God writes his laws in our minds and in our hearts. In Christ, we are made, created 
into God's righteousness. In Christ were created unto good works. Second, the Second Corinthians chapter five verse seventeen. In short, it is written: Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Therefore, in me and my grace, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. How we made as new creatures? We're created in Christ unto good works. How we made as new creatures? Because in Christ we're made the righteousness of God in him. How does that happen? Because the love of God, Romans 5, 5, hath been shed abroad in the hearts, but the was given to us. God has written his laws in our hearts. God has written his laws in our minds. We are created into good works. We're made into the righteousness of God. This is the righteousness that pleases God. Before I was born again, I was a proud fornicator. I was exalted by the world. I had structured discipline when it came to alcohol and when it came to drugs. I was exalted. He is good. Oh, me, he's a good guy. But after I was born again, I found out all that was going to damn me to hell. Though I wouldn't drink all the time, I was still a drunkard, the son of God, and drunk to shut up here at the kingdom of God. Though I wasn't doing drugs all the time, I was still doing nonetheless, and God calls it witchcraft, and they that do that shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Though I was in love with my girlfriend, because we're not married together, the Bible calls that fornication. And that God said I was a fornicator on my way to hell. All my righteousness before I was born again was but filthy rags in the Son of God. Those things that people exalted me for, those things that people said made me a good man, were actually the things that were going to damn my soul to hell. But when I got born again, what happened to me back in July 24th, 1985, 27 years ago, we just celebrated last week. What happened to me after I was born again? All those things I thought were good, all those things I thought were righteous, all became sin. I had strings given to me by a witch doctor. They were supposed to have virtue and power in them. When I wore it, the tie, people thought it was a good thing. They thought I was a religious person. This righteousness was filthy rags that of God. When I got born again, the first thing I got to cut these strings off my body right now. Told my girlfriend and became my wife, cut these strings off me right now. As she cut those strings off me, this that I used to think was righteous, this that I used to think was good, it felt like chains had come off me. I felt free now. I lifted my hands in the air and looked at my shrine I had up on the wall filled with idols and amulets and all these things I collected. People had given to me as gifts. These were considered good things before. When people came in a room and saw that, oh, he is a good man. This became filthy rags. This became an abomination. I had to take it out and throw it away. What happened to me? I became a new creature in Christ. I was made now the righteousness of God in Christ. And these things that I thought were righteousness, which were but filthy rags in God's sight, abominations in God's sight, now I saw it as God saw it, had to get rid of it. Not only that, I had this rap music collection that I collected since the 80s. Music that glorified killing, music that glorified fornication, music that glorified drugs, music that glorified sin. I used to listen to it religiously over the whole collection of it. I knew not how to get rid of that, throw it away. Not only that, I had Hollywood movies. And those Hollywood movies have ungodly themes in them. They are of the devil. And I had to get rid of those VHS movies and throw them away. Not only that, that very day, I was a good friend. If I was your friend back then, and you needed somebody to back you up in a fight, you could call me anytime. I wouldn't ask any questions. I'd beat up whoever wanted me to beat up. I'd protect him everyone, but no matter what you did, I was what they call a good friend. I was somebody you could rely upon, somebody you could call upon. But friendship of the world is enmity with God. Because of those friends of the world, I did bad things. 
again, what the world exalted was filthy rags in God's sight. And I got convicted about these worldly friends and called them up one by one and told them I can no longer be your friend. In their sight, I was now a bad guy. What happened? What did I do? What's wrong with you? I'm now a Christian. If you want to be my friend, you got to come to church. You're not going to come to church. We can't be friends no more. And then when my girlfriend came back in the room, oh, no. We are in sin for three years, what we thought was good. For three years, what people used to exalt this over and consider me a good man about was a sin in the sight of God, the sin of fornication. I didn't know that word back then. I didn't know the Bible back then, but I knew there was a word for it, fornication, and we had to get married that very day again. That's what it means to be righteous. Not our own righteousness. It's in Christ Jesus we're made into the righteousness of God. For once we're saved by grace through faith and none of ourselves, it is a gift that God knows so we should boast. In Christ we are God's workmanship created unto good works in Christ Jesus. For God hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. When we're born again, when we're new creatures in Christ, when we're made into the righteous of God in Christ, when God writes his laws in our minds and our hearts, when we're born again in this New Testament, in this new covenant, that's what it means to be righteous. The righteousness of God, not our own righteousness. We don't do it. We can't do it. That's how my wife got born again. She knew I cannot change myself. She knew me very well. But she, when I told her I was being, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian now. I believe in Jesus. She remembered when she went to church as a teenager, one time back when she was 14 years old. And she remembered they testified how God changed their lives in Christ Jesus. She said to the Lord, if you can change this man, because she knew I couldn't change myself. If you can change this man, like you change those Christians, I will believe. And that's how my wife became a believer in Jesus Christ. Because she saw what God did to those Christians that she saw when she was a teenager. God did for me. I did not do it. I did not change myself. God changed me. I was born again. Made into the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And that kind of person, that righteous man, prayers avail much. Not our own righteousness, not our own good works, the righteousness that God makes us into. Righteousness is not a standing. Again, in this heresy called the word of faith, or rhema, they falsely teach that righteousness is a standing. It's not an actual work. It's a standing. And they teach that when you get into Christ, you're automatically righteous in God's sight. There's others that teach. They'll take a piece of paper, and they'll say, this is you and your sins, and they'll put in the Bible and close it. God didn't see you. He sees Jesus' righteousness. And no matter how it is you're living, no matter how much a vile sinner you are, God didn't see your sins. He sees Jesus. They actually teach that in churches. That's wrong. No. God makes us righteous in Christ Jesus. God creates us in Christ Jesus unto good works. God writes his laws in our hearts and in our minds. In Christ, we become new creatures. This is what it means to be born again. And when you're born again, made, created, made into the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, those are the prayers that have failed much. And we take no glory for answers to our prayers because it has nothing to do with us or our own righteousness. It has to do with the Lord. As it is written, Acts chapter 3. When a lame man was healed, the apostle Peter preached. And he preached very clearly here in the word of God. <clears throat> Acts chapter 3, verse 12. After this lame man was healed, crowds gathered around, and when Peter saw it, the multitude gathered around, 
he answered the people, ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power wholeness we had made this man to walk? See the Peter saying, it wasn't by his own power, and it wasn't by his own holiness. The God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and Jacob, the God of fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom he delivered and denied the presence of Pilate, when he was determined, let him go. But she denied the Holy One, the just that her murder be granted to you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God the raised from the dead, wherever were witnesses. Verse 16, and his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see know, yea, the faith which is by him, hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. It was not the apostle's righteousness. It was not the apostle being an apostle that healed him. It was because of God. And that's why we give God all the glory when he answers our prayers. The reason why we can be righteous is because of God and the power of the new covenant, the new testament, the power of the new birth. And because our righteousness is because of God, to him and him alone be all the glory Psalm. 136 verse 1 Oh give thanks unto the Lord for he is good for his mercy endureth forever God has made us to be righteous in Christ Jesus we are his workmanship created into good works in Christ Jesus and Christ were made into new creatures the old things are passed away but all things are become new for God has written this law in our hearts and our minds. And as we're now the righteous of God in Christ Jesus, our prayers can avail much. And to God and God alone be all the glory. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy faithfulness. We thank thee thy word is truth. And we thank thee, O Lord, for sanctifying and cleansing us that a washing of the water of thy word, that may be presented to thee, O Lord, a glorious church, not having spot the wrinkle of any such thing, to be holy and without blemish, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord.